today I'm going to continue on the journey of the modern day Tower of Babel. So I watched that service of uh, the AI service in Austin. Did anybody watch that service online? There, there was a few people that did. I also watched the service in Germany um, where the AI, the alt, uh, artificial inte- intelligence, was directing the service. And it was, uh, it was interesting because it was very much, it was very much planned. It was very much organized. It was very, it was very uh, thought out and, and trying to appeal to the emotions of men. But I'm not here to appeal to the emotions of man. I want to appeal to the emotion of Jesus. And in that, I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. So you are in a Holy Spirit-led church today. I want you to know we have a plan, but the Holy Spirit, he, he could trump the plan any day he wants to and any time he wants to. He can hijack this service and we'll just let him do what he does because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He leads and guides and directs us in all truth. And, you know, what we've been called here at Lifehouse Fellowship is specifically 191 and 1788 where God has strategically positioned us. He's positioned us between the two cities. And I believe it's, on purpose. I don't believe it was Kesara, Sara, whatever will be, will be. In 2005, I came down here and I was driving around uh, and, and my uncle and I, we had been talking and, and I was serving another pastor at that time and we had been talking about where would be a great piece of land and, and we had been driving around. I drove all the way up to La Mesa, over to Andrews, over to Odessa and, and 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 came on down to McCamey, then over to Big Lake, and and then up Big Lake, then then uh, somehow I ended up right at this intersection. Two thousand and five, and I looked over and I saw a church over over here, and I said, "Man, in my in my heart, this is what I said. That's a great location for a church. Great location." And here we are, 18 years later, God positioned us. It wasn't because I I manipulated God to try to get this building. God just knew what was going to take place. How many of you know the Lord knows the end from the beginning? And if you'll trust him in your process, he'll get you where you need to get you know, ambition and pride would have said, I'm going to go over there and get that building. No, 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 no. I'm going to let God do his work. And in the meantime, I've grown in the process. I promise you I'll be a better pastor in five years. Which means this. I'm going to continue to get better. Every day with the Lord is sweeter. Every day with him, I get better. You can't be with Jesus and not grow. You can't be in his kingdom and not advance. Come on, somebody. And so as I'm thinking about the modern day Tower of Babel, I'm thinking about things that causes God to move. What is it that makes God respond. What is it that God says, "Uh uh-uh, you can't do that. Those are the things I want to make sure. Okay, Lord, I don't want to make you mad in that area. I, I don't want to, I don't want to push a button that causes immediate justice, immediate confrontation of my sin. 
And I believe there's things, and we're, we're, we're seeing it unfold even here in the world spectrum. The culture shift, shifting, where they've said, well, you know, the scripture where it says they, they make good evil, they call it good evil, and they call evil good. We're seeing that unveil right in front of our very eyes. And so it's got me on this journey when I read about the Tower of Babel. And I saw the Lord said, hey, let's go. What is it that causes the Lord to say, let's go? And so my buddy Greg Heard, the pastor's up in uh, Oklahoma. He had a list put together from, a fr from his friend, uh, Shannon O'Dell, and she wrote out 41 things or 41 examples you might struggle with when it comes to the me monster. Me, 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 me. Number one, do you look down on those who are less educated, less affluent, less refined, or less successful than yourself? Do you think of yourself as more spiritual than others? Do you have a judgmental spirit toward those who don't make the same life child, lifestyle choices you do? Dress standards, how your school, your kids. Now, me and Pastor Matt, we was talking about our hair last night. Don't judge me when I come in here with my afro because I got the miracle cream I'm adding right here. I'm putting a little bit of effort right here. And some of you see me put some effort here, Pastor. Okay, okay. I'm not, I did not do it again. All right. Are you quick to find fault with others and verbalize those thoughts to others? Do you have a sharp and critical tongue? Do you frequently correct or criticize your mate, your pastor, or other people in positions of leadership? Do you have, now don't move and we won't know we're talking to you. Now, Turn to your neighbor and say, he's not talking about you. Do you give undue time, attention, or effort to your physical appearance? Oh, I already did that one. Okay. Are you proud of, of the schedule you keep, how disciplined you are, and how much you are able to accomplish? Are you driven to receive approval, praise, and acceptance from others? Are you argumentative? Do you generally think your way is the right way, the only way, and the best way? Ooh, ooh. Don't look around. Do you have a touchy, sensitive spirit? Are you easily offended? Do you get your feelings hurt easily? Are you guilty of pretense, trying to leave a better impression of yourself than is really true? Would the people at church be shocked if they knew what you were like at home? Okay, I'm not looking around. See, I'm focusing right on my notes. Do you have a hard time admitting when you're wrong? Do you have a hard time confessing your sin to God or to others? Not just in generalities, but specifics. Do you have a hard time sharing your real spiritual needs and struggles with others? Do you have a hard time praying aloud with others? Are you excessively shy? We're talking about the me monster. Do you have a hard time reaching out and being friendly to people you don't know at church? Do you resent being asked or expected to serve your family, your parents, or others? Do you become defensive when you're criticized or corrected? Are you a perfectionist? Do you get irked or impatient when people who aren't with people who aren't? Do you tend to be controlling of your mate, your spouse, your children, your friends, and those in the workplace? Do you frequently interrupt people when they're speaking? Does your husband feel intimidated by your spirituality? Excuse me, does your wife feel intimidated by your spirituality? Does your husband or spouse or wife feel like he can never measure up to your expectation of what it means to be a good husband or, a, or wife or a spiritual leader? Do you often complain about the weather, your health, your circumstances, your job, your church? Do you talk about yourself too much? Are you more concerned about your problems, your needs, your burdens than other people's concerns? Do you worry about what others think of you? Too concerned about your reputation or your family's reputation? 
Do you neglect or to express gratitude for little things to God and to others? Do you neglect prayer and intake of the word? Do you get hurt if your accomplishments or acts of service are not recognized or rewarded? Now, I'm going to have this list on my Facebook page, okay? So you can just copy and paste and bring it up, okay? And you go through this. Do you get hurt if your feelings or opinions are not considered when your spouse or your boss is making a decision or if you are not informed when a change or, dis- or a decision is made? Woo! Do you react to rules? Do you have a hard time being told what to do? Are you self-conscious because of your lack of education or natural beauty or socioeconomic status? Do you avoid participating in certain events for fear of being embarrassed or looking foolish? Do you avoid being around certain people because you feel inferior compared to them? You don't feel like you measure up. Are you uncomfortable inviting people to your home because you don't think it's nice enough or you can't afford to do the lavish entertaining? Is it hard for you to let others know when you need help? When is the last time you said these words to a family member, a friend or a coworker? I was wrong. Would you please forgive me? Are you sitting here thinking how many of these questions apply to someone you know? Got you. We can all lump ourselves in some form or fashion on the me monster. And that's what I want to get us to as a church is getting things that are selfish out of us. That it's about others and it's about him. And I'm a vessel meet for the master's use broken and spilled out. You mean broken? Yes, you have to be broken in order to be spilled out. And what we have is a lot of well put together people in the body of Christ. And the Lord is asking, when's the last time you've been broken? When's the last time you said, God, I can't do this without you. When's the last time? I can't answer that. I can only answer it for myself. Genesis chapter 11 is a great, interesting story, example of what caused God to move. It was people who were, who were overcome by the me monster called pride. And I want to just, I want to address pride today. You know, there's a cost to pride. The most beautiful angel that God ever created. The most powerful angel that God ever created, the most majestic uh, angel that God ever created, the most talented angel that God ever created, the most, uh, if you saw his beauty, the Bible talks about Lucifer as one being of great beauty. Head over the praise and worship team of heaven. Pride puffed him up. Pride took him up. Pride and his inability to address that within himself caused him to go to the very throne of God and say, I can sit there. Pride. Someone say pride. There's a cost to pride. Pride. And there's a cost of pride. The Tower of Babel, I'm interested in the behaviors that cause God to move. If you think for one second that God is not interested in what is going on down here, right here, right now, you've got another thing coming.
He's very interested. And the king is about to move. If we are seeing a modern day Tower of Babel, that I promise you, God ain't going to sit much longer. He's about to respond. Genesis 11 states, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. The consistent cultural redefining of words. Do you know we no longer get the definition of our words from the Webster Dictionary? It's Wikipedia. It's other. They're redefining terms and definitions. And this serves as a way of systematically altering the language of civilization. He who defines the words controls the dialogue. He who defines the words controls the dialogue. Can I stop and insert something here? That's why when something comes up in your life that you don't speak what's in you, just, just all the junk. No, you get in the word and you start speaking the word. You get a word on the matter. You get a word about the situation and we attack it with the word and not my mental knowledge. He who defines the words controls the dialogue. Through clever twists and spins, wordsmiths of all media are rewriting the dictionary thereby directly or indirectly framing the new world with new words and definitions. And this gives proof that Babel is on the rise. Now Genesis chapter 11, turn over there in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, go get you one. If you need a Bible, go to the Connection Center. We give away Bibles. You need a Bible. Well, I use my app on my phone. Okay, I love that, and I use it. But there's nothing like having your own Bible. And when I come to church, bring my Bible. Amen? All right. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 through 9. <clears throat> now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone. And they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And I, I want you to underline that. I want you to highlight that. Because there's something about when the world gets one language, and, uh, and they're of one mind. But there's, not, there's nothing like when the body of Christ, there's a, there's a new covenant grace, you know, under that under the grace covering when the body of Christ understands indeed the people are one and they have all gotten one language. When we get in one accord and we're speaking the same thing, there's great power released. Okay? Now this is for selfish ambition and pride was being 
built up in their hearts that they could just build anything they wanted to. Let's build the, this tower up into the heavens. And so, and this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. When that took place, great confusion set on the people. I use this scripture to talk about the pure language of heaven and why it's so important that we speak in tongues because it's the purity of the language that makes us in one accord, that brings us in, in out here scattered, brings us in together. And what has the enemy been so hung up on? We can go to every church in America. I'm just going to talk about America. We can, we agree about everything, but what's the most divisive thing in the local church? Huh? How about tongues? The most divisive thing. We agree on Jesus. We agree on his death, burial, and resurrection. We, we agree that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. We agree that um, he's coming back for his people. We agree uh, sometimes that, you know, if the Lord wants to heal us, no, we believe in full healing. We believe that God wants you redeemed from the curse. We believe those things. And we can kind of agree to disagree on that, but uh, on some of that stuff. But when you bring up the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues, you now create a great divide in the body. Why is the enemy been so persistent about bringing division amongst the body of Christ when it comes to the gift of tongues. Because he understands the power that will be released when we unify with one voice. You go ahead and clap on that one. That was a good one. And so there's, a, there's, there's this thing that's going on in America, and it's called religion. As long as you don't step on my doctrinal beliefs, we'll be okay. And we've, we've kind of skirted things just to hold the line. We was in Israel not too long ago and we was talking to our, our guide and this is, this is our, this was our first trip over. And, and, you know, there's so many Palestinian rule, Jewish ruled, and you go into another part of the city and it's Palestinian ruled. Then you go outside that wall, then it's Israeli Jewish ruled. And we're like, how do you do this? And the, in the Israel, we stand with Israel and we're just like, we're praying. We, we told the God, we're praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We're praying for our Israel, our Jewish brothers and sisters. We're praying for peace. He says, no, don't pray for peace. And we're like, what? That's odd. No, the Lord tells us to pray for peace. He says, no, just pray. Pray for quietness. Pray to be quiet. Pray for quietness because if peace comes, that means someone has to rule. Have we bought in a lie that we think we can just be quiet and sweep it under the rug and that it will never 
come back to bite us on the hiney. And let me tell you, right now we're seeing it. You see, can we transfer that over to the body of Christ? We'll just be quiet. I'm not going to fight over that. We believe that Jesus is good. But what if the Lord wants to unify us in our voice? Man. Do you see that the way I see that? The importance and the power of praying in tongues. That divine language, that pure language of heaven that God gives you and I as the believer. Hmm. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Clark here at Lifehouse Fellowship and today we're going around asking what your favorite thing about Lifehouse is. We are here with Deja and Dre. Deja, what is your favorite part about Lifehouse Fellowship? Our favorite part about Lifehouse Fellowship is that the community and that it is family oriented and that when we come in, it's Holy Spirit led and that when we come in, it is realistic to what we have aligned in our lives. So that's what we love about Lifehouse. Amen. All right, so Logan and Mariah, what are your favorite things about Lifehouse Fellowship? Uh, the worship was amazing today. The message was on point and I think touched all of us. We are with Megan and James Nelson. What is your favorite thing about Lifehouse Fellowship? We just love the atmosphere. We love that every time we show up, the Holy Spirit shows up. He's always here. I absolutely love that our children are being fed into and the worship team is out of this world. I'm here with Aziza and Jose Silva. What is your favorite thing about Lifehouse Fellowship? My favorite thing about Lifehouse Fellowship is you can feel the Holy Spirit as soon as you walk into the front doors. The teachings are always Holy Spirit led. Like it don't matter if we don't get to the sermon or it's just whatever happens, happens. We never know what, yeah. what what's gonna happen until we get here. All right, I'm here with Joel Davis today. Joel, what is your favorite part about Lifehouse Fellowship? My favorite part about Lifehouse Fellowship is the worship and how they have the ability to flow with the Holy Spirit and not have to stand a plan track. Amen. If you live or are visiting the Odessa Midland, Texas area, we would love to see you at Lifehouse Fellowship. Service times are Sunday at 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Visit lifehousefellowship.net for more information, and we hope to see you soon.